Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Riverfront. This is episode number 460 of the World's Most Dangerous Podcast, where we discuss the Cincinnati Reds and occasionally D'Angelo Jimenez. I'm your host, Chad Dotson. With me this week, your friend and mine, Nate Dotson. How are you, Nate? Chad, you know, I've been reading a lot of the ancient Stoics lately, and I try not to get too high or too low, keep it keep it even keel. But I got to say, man, it is uh, – it's nice not being a Georgetown basketball fan. Ha! Wow, he went there right off the top. <laughs> Man. Um, well, if long-time listeners of the show will know um, I'm uh, quite vocally a uh, Virginia fan, but I went to another school as well, and that is Georgetown. I've been a Georgetown Hoyas fan since I was 10 years old, and they've lost 25 consecutive Big East games, and it is bad. The Reds are not the worst team that I cheer for. <laughs> So thanks for nothing there, Nate. Uh, you, tr- you talk about not getting too high and too low. How high or how, how low are you over the fact that the Reds have officially released Mike Moustakas? He uh, was designated for assignment, and uh, yeah, obviously he's not going to go to AAA, so he uh, he's actually officially no longer a Red now. Or, where does that, how does that make you feel? I said on the last podcast that I was not going to disparage Moose ever again, so I uh... – did not crack open the bottle of champagne, and I hope that somebody picks him up and he's healthy and has a dope career. I actually 100% agree with that. I wish him the best of luck. I hope he plays really well. I don't want to see him in a red uniform again, but I, I don't wish him ill. Um, Nate, do you want to do a viewer mail episode? Oh, I, did, I thought Christmas already happened. <laughs> there's very little uh, news yeah. to talk about this week. Uh, there's a little bit we'll get touch in right now, but then we have a bunch of... Uh, crazy, uh, wacky questions from uh, our friends. Now, before we go any further, if you're watching on YouTube, hit that like button and smash the subscribe button. Uh, if you're listening to the audio version, as always, follow, subscribe, wherever you wherever you get your, your podcasts, and you'll get these uh, wacky antics delivered to your phone every single week. Um, before we get into these uh, viewer mail questions, Nate, I want to mention one thing. This is our first episode of the new year. It's 2023. Ooh. Everyone making their resolutions. We made our red resolutions last week. I encourage you to go listen to those. Um, I uh, have not yet broken my Great American Ballpark, uh, my streak of not going to Great American Ballpark, but I did announce last week that that is going to happen. Um, at the end of the year on uh, on Twitter, that's at Riverfront Cincy, I went through and listed the t- our top 10 most downloaded episodes of last year. And they were all front loaded. You might not be surprised to, to hear because, you know, uh, some uh, only the only the the strong uh, the strongest of you can stick with us through, uh, uh, you know, the the valleys, not not the peaks, the valleys that uh, Nick Crawl told, told us about. But anyway, uh, go check that out on uh, on Twitter. What I found out was we delivered sixty two episodes of the world's most dangerous podcasts. Uh, podcast into your uh, podcast YouTube feed uh, feeds this year. Nate, what do you, what do you think? 62 episodes in one calendar year. That's uh, that's not bad. Yeah, I thought it was impressive that in that top 10, it was uh, only the ones that you were on vacation for. So how, how that I happened? Think, I, think, I think that says something. <laughs> um, now, last year was a lot of fun, uh, mainly just because of this community. It was about the only fun part of being a Reds fan last year. And it can't be worse than that. So we're going to, we're going to have a blast this year. Yeah. This year's going to be way better. Um, obviously, uh, many of the, uh, most, uh, downloaded podcasts last year came around, uh, like, uh, the number two most downloaded one was an emergency podcast after Sonny Gray, Eugenio Suarez, Jesse Winker were all traded away there in a short period of time. So that was our first ever live stream. Um, the next episode, number three was be careful what you ask for episode number 419. That was right after Phil Castellini's remarks. Um, and then after that, it was, uh, you know, the billboard campaign launched. And so those were sort of the, the high markers of the year. The number one surprised me, surprisingly, was uh, episode number 452 later in the year, where uh, uh, it was named Less Than Memorable and Unremarkable, if you remember that uh, episode, Nate. And I don't know why that one was so popular other than we were just saying goodbye to Mike Miner. Maybe everyone was really excited about that. But anyway, so uh, whatever, that's... Um, it was a good way to recap 2022. I think there are plenty of re- more reasons to be more optimistic going into 2023. Oh, yeah. we'll, we'll talk about some of those as we move into this. Um, 
The only other news really of the week, a couple things here quickly, uh, to the extent that anyone cares, Major League Baseball, MLB.com had their power rankings out. They had the Reds 25th on the list, Nate, 25th out of 30. You know, that's what we talked, and ESPN had the Reds 30th. So uh, is this uh, improvement? Is or, I think you you made a had a pretty bold take on this 25th ranking. We're trending up, man. No, I um, my, my my optimistic outlook is that the Reds will be better than the 25th best team. I mean, it says a little something that that's my optimistic outlook that I'm rooting for a top 24 finish. But I just I just don't see the Reds being as bad. I don't think last year anybody expected them to go and win any World Series, but we thought they could be fun, and I don't and at least, you know, win some games, be somewhat competitive. I don't see any difference this year. It's not going to be a good team. It's not going to win the division. It's probably not going to make a wild card run, though we'll get into that. They're not going to be a dumpster fire. We keep saying that. Last week we sort of went in depth on why the Reds aren't going to lose 100 games again. And I still firmly believe that. It just It's, it's hard to lose 100 games, and so many things went wrong. But if you look at it one way, you, last year's team did have, at least for a, a portion of the season – Luis Castillo, Tyler Malley, Brandon Drury, Tyler Naquin, mm-hmm. Tommy Pham, had Kyle Farmer all season, have none of those guys. Um, and they've added uh, Kevin Newman, uh, Luke Mail, Kurt Casale, and the immortal, Will Myers. Listen, so, uh, I don't care for your facts, all right? <laughs> this, is, this is the new year. We're getting close to spring training. And I think a full year of um, Hunter, Nick, and Graham – might outweigh because they, they were bad for large, large swaths of the first half of last season. So you replace that with some quality production. Maybe it uh, balances out the loss of Castillo and Mally. I don't know. I'm trying. I'm trying here. Give me a break, okay? <laughs> no, I, I, I firmly believe they're not going to lose 100 games again. And uh, we do have a question about that later that we can uh, we can discuss. But um, and maybe I'm just banking so much on the fact that literally everything went wrong. So if just literally everything doesn't go wrong this year, uh, then they're not going to be yeah. as bad. Um, and, you know, again, a lot of it depends on health for me. Joey Votto, Tyler Stevenson, uh, those pitchers being healthy all year. Uh, you know, uh, TJ Antone and, and Lucas Sims getting them back uh, in the bullpen. You know, Side note, have you do you follow TJ Antone on Instagram? I do not think that I do, no. The guy's monster. He's what? He's out there doing a workout monster. He's out there doing these crazy broad jump jumps. Like, I'm expecting big things out of TJ Antone this year. He's working the, for it for sure. Is he the Michael Lorenzen of the 2023 Cincinnati Reds? Is that what you're saying? Um, less of My- a uh, no. He probably won't be posing for GQ shirtless anytime soon. But <laughs> he's putting the work in. I love to see it. Well, good, good. Yeah, no, I hope he can come back. I he and, and Lucas Sims both. I have some lingering concerns over the you know crack down on sticky stuff uh on the yeah ball and so we'll see you know how their spin rates are but when healthy uh, they have been great at times in the past so the bullpen should be somewhat better um other news of the week again we've already discussed this in recent weeks don't really need to dive too far into it but uh you remember uh i don't know three weeks ago or so john morosi of mlb network reported that the reds were interested in uh johnny cueto and and, and this week ken rosenthal at the athletic uh, listed the Reds among three teams, the uh, Marlins and the Padres were the other two, as uh, still being interested in Johnny Cueto's services. Not sure that there's a whole lot you want to add to that. You, you're certainly welcome to if you'd like, but uh, I don't know. I, it comes back to I, I want fun players. They're going to lose a lot of games, so I bring bring around as many fun players as you want. So that's been my consistent analysis of that. Just do it already. There is it, – it's it's a win-win. Even if he's terrible, he's not going to be that expensive. The fans are going to love it. And if he is anywhere close to what he was last year, then the Reds might have a really, really good starting rotation. Just well, thank do you. it. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess that's a – again, he's not, he's not – I don't, let's not expect him to improve on last year where he was – Of course not. Uh, uh, you know, 160 innings or so, 3.35 ERA. Uh, good season, good season. But he's going to be 49 years old, I think, next year. <laughs> but we talk about health and, um, you know, uh, how how important that can be for this team. And it's going to be never more so than with the pitching staff. The pitching staff, if you remember, going into last year, Sonny Gray, Luis Castillo, Tyler Malley, and the kids. And, and so you would expect the, for at least the, 
first half of the season, the rotation the Reds will have this year to be not as good. But, you know, this group uh, of, of Hunter Green, Nick Lodolo, Graham Ashcraft, and then you add Cueto to that. And then for your fifth starter, you've got guys like, you know, Justin Dunn, whose brother plays for the University of Virginia Cavaliers. Um, Brandon Williamson, uh, the immortal Connor Overton, uh, Luis Sessa. I don't know. I mean, you know, there it, it's a lot's going to depend on health and pitchers never stay healthy. But there are a group of pitchers that are either cromulent or significantly more than cromulent. Um, yeah. Above cromulent, five, I guess you would say. Five guys fighting for the fifth spot in the rotation sounds pretty good. Five guys fighting for four and five. Not quite as exciting to me. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So bring on Johnny Cueto and also sign uh, Bronson Royal if you'd like. I don't care. Hey, just do, just do it. Adam Dunn. Uh, can Adam Dunn pitch? Adam Dunn. Hey, get, let's get Harang. Aaron Harang back. Let's get the whole band back together. Um, last thing before we get into some viewer mail. Joey Votto. You remember? You remember Joey Votto? I think Nate. Or do you? It's been a while. Do you remember Joey Votto? Um, I've got a picture of him on my nightstand. Is the picture of him at the chess tournament <laughs> where he proceeded <laughs> to lose it. to a nine-year-old? And shame my beard-growing abilities, that <laughs> handsome devil. That's true. Um, he was on uh, – the Reds had this uh, hot stove league uh, show, and uh, Mark Sheldon and Tommy Thrall. And so he, he went on there and uh, was discussing a lot of things. Some of them were interesting, and you can sort of read a transcript of part of it and then listen to the uh, the show if you go to redlegnation.com. Doug Gray had a pretty good recap, but he said uh, – one of the things he said, truly, I did, didn't play well enough last year to even justify a starting job. He was being asked about any adjustments that uh, that he might need to make because of the uh, the shoulder surgery that he had uh, late last season. He said, I, truly, I, don't, I didn't play well enough last year to even justify a starting job. So the idea of making any sort of technical changes, I don't think that's sustainable because I wouldn't be able to play well enough. Uh, Joey says lots of things that are above my head. I don't, I'm not sure I really understand what he means there. I don't think. Any adjustments would be – you You have an analysis of that? No, I tried to decipher it myself. I was really hoping <laughs> that you could explain it to me. <laughs> I can't figure that Joey out. Ex- said it, I believe it. Bingo. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll take your word for it, Joey. He did say some other things, though. He said, I'm looking forward to playing. I miss playing. I miss playing well. And I think that's the key for him. If he has another bad year, it's definitely – he's going to want to uh, to hang it up. Um. And this, you know, obviously could be the the last year of his contract. The Reds do have a a $20 million team option for 2024 um, that has a a $7 million buyout. So the Reds will have to pay Joey Votto $7 million to go away. Uh, I'm in favor of fun players, so keep keep paying him to to be a Red. Um, He said, I think with two healthy arms, I'm going to be able to play well again. I don't have very much doubt about that. And then – he said, uh, I'm not willing to make the prediction I'll be 100% by the start of spring training, but he's sort of on course for that. Any quick thoughts about Votto's comments? Yeah, you kind of left out the biggest piece of news that I took away from that interview, and it was that he said he hopes he never has to broadcast ever again. Because he wants to and play I forever? I don't know why you'd steal that joy <laughs> from us fans at this early stage, Joey, but yeah, if that means you're staying on the diamond, I'm okay with that. Um, I love that... You know, he, he talked about where he was in his rehab, and he said there's a big difference between doing well, which the doctor's telling me is, and being ready. And I think that's important to keep in mind. He's he's not a spring chicken anymore. It's going to take him some time, and we certainly need to give him all the time that he needs. Um, I don't know. The only other thing that, I, that really jumped out to me about that interview was when he talked about all of the little things um, how that's about his approach. Would he, would, he, would he change his approach or anything? And he said, you know, I, I just try to hit the ball hard. He said, the ball is a variable. And that jumped out to me. That shouldn't be a thing, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> the ball should not be the variable in your approach at the plate. I can't imagine another sport where, like, suddenly Evan McPherson's missing these field goals because the ball's made out of concrete. <laughs> <laughs> could be or they yeah, add three right. pounds to a basketball I don't know that's not uh, important but that jumped out to me and just gets under my skin the MLB Rob Manfred just leave the game alone so yeah stop stop playing with uh, your balls uh, Rob Manfred um yes. did you, you you mentioned sorry you mentioned uh the Instagrams a moment ago so I'm gonna I'm gonna follow it up uh, and I, I know you saw it as well but Joey Votto had 
uh, part of a workout and he was sort of talking about his, uh, his theories and just, again, it's all over my head. I was a lousy high school baseball player. So I, I, you know, I could never could hit, but, um, uh, I thought, I thought that was pretty fascinating. Just to, everything about him, just getting, anytime you get a peek behind the curtain with Joey, Bob, it's fascinating mm-hmm. to me. All right. Uh, Nate, what are the, what's, what, what other news is there this week? Well, I'll tell you what, there's almost none because I hopped on to MLB trade rumors and the only two entries since our last episode were that Votto discusses rehab and that David Bell's contract is up. Riveting stuff. Riveting. Riveting. Stuff. A, lot of, a lot of action in Reds land. I did see in that David Bell little write-up that um, apparently Nick Crawl's contract link is not publicly known. Really? Which I found, found interesting. <laughs> that is interesting. I also can't believe I didn't know that already, but... You think he's on a year-to-year contract, or you know, uh, it's not like he has other options to be general manager. I think he's anywhere. got the uh, you know the the new Xi Jinping Emperor for Life deal, and Nick Crawl <laughs> okay. is going to be the GM for as long as he wants the job. The party well, has chosen him as their representative. If he keeps delivering those crawl halls, then I'm all in on that. Well, yeah, the okay. best minor league system in perpetuity. You know, that um, might actually be the move. We should just transfer our Reds fanhood. To like Chattanooga. <laughs> Let's do that. Just Why not? I mean, on, only be Lookouts fans. There we go. I'm not sure that uh, I know Misery loves company and we have a lot of loyal fans, but we may lose one or two if we uh, become a strictly Lookouts branded podcast. Um, Nate, uh, so since there was so little news to talk about this week, we did uh, what we commonly do, not commonly, but uh, occasionally. We reached out to our friends at uh, patreon.com slash riverfront for some topics. And we were going to reach out to Twitter if we uh, didn't get enough, but uh, the, the family at patreon.com slash riverfront since he came through in spades. Unfortunately, the very first question is from probably one of the, uh, let's just say not one of the brightest lights of the riverfront uh, constellation. It's our buddy Joe Farsing. Joe says this, I was a Jeff Treadway fan growing up. Discuss. So, Nate, I'm guessing you don't even remember Jeff Treadway. Is that uh, true or not true? The name rang a bell, but I uh, <laughs> I had to look him up. Well, Jeff Treadway came up in 1987. And, you know, I, I was looking at his uh, career, and I would have sworn he played for the Reds longer than 126 games over two years. And, and I was thinking, well, why, do, why does he stand out so much? Because I like that guy, too. He was, you know, uh, sort of a tiny little infielder, 5'10", 170. He – uh you know, a left-handed batter. Uh, he, he was sort of, I don't know, uh, I'm not sure who, who to uh, compare him to. Uh, maybe a, an earlier Jeff Keppinger. That's, again, you have to be, that's sort of a deep cut for a certain generation of Reds fans in, as well. But, and I was trying to figure out why, why did he stand out for me as well? Because I did enjoy him, uh, Joe, watching him play. And I think I've discovered why, because after he left Cincinnati, he spent the next four years in hot Atlanta. That's what, to, that's what the cool kids call Atlanta. Mm-hmm. In 1996, Hot Atlanta, um, and so I had to watch him on TBS all the time. Uh, you know, uh, America's team, the Atlanta Braves. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure what else there's to say about uh, Jeff Treadwell except perfectly solid left-handed hitter. You know, uh, could play a couple different positions. He uh, just uh, do need to say that in. See, we're recording this on January 5th, so you will hear it on January 6th. On January 22nd. Jeff Treadway will celebrate his 60th birthday. Ooh. So happy 60th birthday to Jeff Treadway. The only thing I'd like to add is that apparently he uh, was, was known for pulling off the hidden ball trick at least twice in his career. I was unable to find any video on that, but I did discover this little nugget. And I said, of all the hidden ball tricks ever executed in a major league game, only one ended up with jail time. And that was in 1915, following a trick, Reds manager Buck Herzog was so upset that his player got called out by the home plate ump that a fist fight broke out and both men were cited for disturbing the peace. Outstanding. So there you go. Thank you, Jeff Treadway, for that. (laughs) You, Jeff Treadway, H-U-G-H, you, Jeffrey Treadway, one of the very few Hughes in uh, baseball history. So uh, let's let's continue our, our march down memory lane from our buddy Joey Gaditza. You know, Joey's from Canada. Did you know that, Nate? Gross. Yeah, it's disgusting. Um, Joey says, Joe Oliver was my hero growing up. 
Anyone else have any love for that dude? Now, you remember Joe Oliver, surely, Nate. I got so much love for Joe Oliver. He's one of my first loves. Oh, interesting. He and Olivia Newton-John. <laughs> okay. That makes sense, I guess. Uh, yeah. Tell me about it, stud. <laughs> you know, that's you talking to Joe Oliver, I think. There. Um, Joe Oliver was part of the original guy that uh, made me realize in retrospect that I didn't know a whole lot as a kid about uh, baseball because I thought he was amazing. I mean, I thought he was an all-star yeah. level catcher. And you know what? He did play 13 years in the big leagues, eight of those uh, seasons in Cincinnati, and uh, was a starter for probably six, seven seasons in the big leagues, a, a primary starter. Uh, but just the fact that he was a 24-year-old starting on that 1990 team, and uh, I didn't care that he had a 231 batting average because he was a catcher. And you weren't supposed to, but he, you know, he did not post a very high uh, wins above replacement total in his career. As a matter of fact, his 3.8 wins above replacement is a, just about half of the career wins above replacement total of Jeff Treadway. So, um, but Joe Oller was the catcher on my team, the 1990 team, and he delivered that incredible uh, highlight in game two of the World Series, the double down the um, left field line that scored um, Billy Bates. And uh, one game two for the Reds, give them a 2-0 lead in the series. So, Godspeed to Joe Oliver. Um, also, uh, he he's had a ton of Godspeed. <laughs> he had very little. Oh my goodness! Yeah, Billy Bates had it all. That's a good point. One of the slowest Reds of our lifetime. Who, who's who's it? Corky Miller's in that conversation. Who Sean Casey's in that conversation. Conver Sean Casey's probably leader for in the sure. clubhouse. Well, he's not the leader in the clubhouse. He hasn't made it to the clubhouse yet. He's he's trailing the uh, the race. <laughs> To the club, I think the uh, the Joe Oliver conversation is kind of interesting though because looking back at Reds catchers, I've kind of had this weird affinity for all of them. I mean, he was followed by Eddie Tobinzi, who I also really liked but wasn't particularly great. Uh, Benito Santiago for a year or so there, when for some reason I think it had to be because of you, I called him Bento Santiago. <laughs> so go figure I think out. that was like, I think that's actually one of our brothers said that because he didn't follow <laughs> baseball very much, and that's what he thought that his name was, and we picked up on that. Ben Bowser hard. <laughs> um, but then like Jason LaRue, David Ross, Ryan Hannigan, Messerocco. I mean, we had years of Tucker, and now Tyler Stevenson. There's been a long list of Reds backstops, and I've liked almost all of them. I don't particularly have any fond memories of Paul Bacco, but. <laughs> no, but sure, you're right, though. Does. I'm sure Mrs. Baco, <laughs> uh, who listens faithfully to the show. Um, no, I mean, uh, Ryan Hannigan, Ramon Hernandez. I mean, there's a, you're right. That's a, that's a great point yeah. that we could go back. And for some reason, I have very fond memories of a lot of Reds catchers that weren't always very good. Um, so sometimes good, sometimes okay. But uh, we now have one that's actually legitimately potentially great and probably. Is he the? Is this if if Tyler Stevenson can stay healthy and be the Tyler Stevenson? This is my viewer mail question to you, Nate, and can become what we think he can be, what he should be, what we've seen out of him. Is he the first first great Reds catcher since Johnny Bench? Have there been any? And great's a, great's a tough, really good even, you know, significantly above average Reds catcher since uh, since Johnny Bench. If he can stay healthy for what, three seasons and perform at the bottom of his sort of like projections, then I think he becomes that guy. Because three seasons of, of, of above average offense is more than a Reds catcher has really been able to say. And yeah, had, that's just if he barely scratches the surface. If he reaches his potential, I think he is a multi-time all-star, best catcher in the entire league kind of talent. I thought we had that, and we did briefly because he did make one all-star team with uh, Devin Mezzarocco, but injuries mm -hmm. finished that out. Um, and I, I know we're going to have this conversation. I, I'm not, I don't want to get into it tonight because we're going to have it f ten times, five times during the regular season. Every time he gets some sort of little niggling in injury, we're going to – everybody's going to say, why isn't he playing first base or why isn't he DH? And I, I'm, I haven't changed my mind. I do not think he, nope. uh, he needs to move from catcher unless he wants to, unless he thinks he needs to. But if he wants to be the catcher, it just again. I say what I'm going to get into it, so I'm not going to get into it. But he needs to be catcher. He has made it perfectly clear that he does not want to leave the catcher yeah. position. Whew, I thought you were saying leave Cincinnati. I was 
I'm thankful about that. Hey, you, you follow a, a Tyler Stevenson on the uh, on the Instagrams? I do. What about uh, what about Joe Oliver? I don't. No, I don't need to um, buy real estate in Florida or wherever he is now. <laughs> he is selling real estate, and so if you're in the area, uh, go go meet with a uh, Joe Oliver. Get you a good deal. Yeah. Um, and if you if you are looking to buy in the Richmond, Virginia area or Central Virginia area, I know a good uh, real estate agent for you as well. So just shoot, hit hit me up on the Twitters. I'll uh, I'll point you in the right direction. Um, Jeff Treadway, follow follow him on Instagram. Um, well, after this podcast, <laughs> guess right. see, see what he's been up to. If he's still pulling those hidden ball tricks with his grandkids. <laughs> Joe Oliver's best season with the bat came in two thousand at age thirty four. The only time in his career he had an OPS plus above one hundred. Um, and had a pretty good season, only 69 games, uh, which is nice. But uh, 265 average, 313 on base, 105 OPS plus, 803 OPS, 10 homers, 35 ribeye stakes, and he was out of the league one year later. After yeah, if you'd have asked me if Joe Oliver played in the 2000s, I would have said the hard no. But then I would have conveniently forgotten the 2000, the year 2000 was 23 flipping years ago. You're We're old man. We did it. Yes. Yes, you are. Um, Joe Oliver also uh, has the distinction of he finished his career in 2001 um, with his own little space odyssey. He played for both the Yankees and the Red Sox in the same year. Ooh. That doesn't happen very often. Yeah. So good uh, good work, Joe Oliver. We've now spent way too much time talking about you. But no, you can't spend too much time talking about Joe Oliver Thanks. because down the third baseline, here comes Billy Bates and the Reds. Uh win game two. Hey, do you remember who won game three of the uh, 1990 World Series night? I don't think it was the A's. Probably some other team. It was a, the, whoever the A's were playing. All right, our next uh, question is one that I'm a little nervous about. We are, as you know, we are an international show. We draw downloads and family members and viewers and listeners from all over the globe. We already mentioned Canada, which I looked it up. I went to Wikipedia. It's an actual different country it's in it's on the same, same continent as us but it is a different country i've never been there hmm. is it like finland and we're not entirely sure it's a real place i'm well you know I, i'm not sure it is they've got a queen or they had a queen god rest her soul um and then she you know uh went off to the grand throne room in the sky and uh now they have a king so maybe they're maybe they're british if they were, it would relate them to this next guy. Bingo. This next guy is our buddy Calvin Medcalf. Uh, can we call him Cal? Cal Medcalf Jr.? Is that, is that, <laughs> that going to be a problem? Let us know, Calvin. Yeah. All right. Calvin's question this is the second time he's laid this on us to embarrass us. Whilst, first of all, okay. Whilst. How British do you have to be to start your viewer mail question with whilst? I love it. I love it. Whilst we wait for Trey Mancini to inevitably sign with the Reds, I thought it would be fun to give you guys some more English place names to pronounce. You did well last time, but these are harder, so let's see how you do. Nate, you want to take the first one? All right, I'm going to go here. Let's see. Uh, the first one, I think it's Tainmouth. Tainmouth, maybe Tainmouth. What do you got? You got to pick one. Tainmouth or Tainmouth? Tainmouth. I'm going to go with Tainmouth, just because I know that's wrong, but T E I G N M O U T H. Sorry, take Tain Tain Muth. It's got to be Muth. Wacky Brits. All right, so that's uh, I'm gonna agree with Nate. We'll go with what did we say? Tain Muth. Tain All right, here, here I'm gonna take a stab at the next one. Um, M A R Y L E B O N E. And so, if this were Celebrity Jeopardy with uh with Sean Connery. There, it would be Mary Labone. So that's what I'm going to say, Mary Labone. That's what I'm going with too, just because I can't. I read, read this question earlier. I've been saying it all day. Mary Labone, Mary Labone. Oh, um, it reminds me of. Uh, did you see the the Celebrity Jeopardy? Did you ever watch that on the Saturday Night Live? Oh yeah. And uh, oh, I can't remember the guy's name that played uh, the Sean Connery role, but uh, uh, the the category was Let It Snow. Do you remember that one? How you pronounce it? Go look it up if you didn't see it. Also, we got to get us one of those big Turd Ferguson hats. Oh, it's a funny name. It's a big hat. It's funny. All right, so um, no, do we, we'd have to take a, have a real guess here. It's probably not Mary Labone, although I wish it were. 
I, Meryl, I don't know. Meryl Bonnie. Meryl Bonnie. Bonnie is, was how I would change it. So Mar, Mar, Marla Bonnie. <laughs> Mar, Marilla Bonnie. It's not uh, like I'm having a stroke. Thanks, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my goodness. Yeah, that's we messed that one up. Um, all right, what do you got for the next one? This seems like it should be easy. I'm gonna change my name real quick for the viewers out there. Um, I'm trying to figure out how it isn't what it sounds like, unless Calvin's just throwing us a wild card, which would be classic Calvin. Um, L E O M I N S T E R Lowminster. I'm gonna say low. What about Lowminster? I That's prefer, what I prefer Highminster. <laughs> okay, all right. There we go. Um, next is B E L V O I R C A S T L E. So two words, and it's obviously uh, Belvoir Castilli. Castilli. See, he's he. Calvin threw us a curveball. Castle's the word that's pronounced weird in this name. That's what that I'm saying. That would be a curveball. I'm going with Belvoir. Belvoir, Belvoir Castle. Belvoir Castle. Belvoir Castilli. Um, all right, last one. <laughs> oh, man. M-O-U-S-E-H-O-L-E. -E. One word, M-O-U-S-E-H-O-L-E. -E. Now, that one, I, I know he's throwing us a curve because that's obvious, right? That's what you call people from Boston, right? Mouse hole? <laughs> exactly. Mouse hole. Um, uh, Mouse hole. A village and fishing port in Cornwall, England. Nate, it's, it's approximately two and a half miles. That's four kilometers south of Penzance. It's on the shore of Mounts Bay. What do you think about that? Kilometers. I don't understand kilometers. I don't either. Metric system. I don't even know what you're talking about. Um, muzzle? Muscle? It's got to be something crazy like that. M Stick muzzle? with mouse hole. Stick with mouse hole. Right. It's mouse hole. Calvin, we're stick <laughs> sticking it with mouse hole. Um, <laughs> I almost said something that I shouldn't have said there. So, um, Calvin, thanks for that question, I guess. Next question was, it comes from Rex Scott. Now, which, uh, which foreign country is Rex Scott from, Nate? That is the most American name I have ever heard in my life. <laughs> That's exactly right. Rex is American. He's a through and through. Yes. So, uh, guys, you solicited questions by saying you need to smile about something. As a matter of fact, we did. My wife has been a teacher for 37 years. She told me today that she was having a good weekend when I asked why. She said, just little kids, being with them. That comment speaks to her love for her students and dedication to them. It also attests to why most educators do the work they do. Can you each talk about a teacher who made a difference in your lives? I think there's a couple that we can mention here, Nate, that we have the same. Um, but uh, that's a heartwarming story, though, right? Yeah, you want just to... The, just little kids. Yeah, there's, there's a couple in our lives. Um, for me, go ahead. Our parents, our parents are the big one, right? So both of our parents were educators. So I never needed to search for an appreciation for school. I always saw firsthand how important, um, you know, the classroom was, but where I got a lot of love and where I still do is for some of my coaches. Um, I had some really good basketball, baseball coaches through the year that just helped me learn a lot about hard work and discipline and commitment and, you know, not feeling sorry for yourself. So I don't know, coach Bentley, um, coach Wyrick, mom, dad. Thanks guys. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, shout out to Bill and Melinda Dotson, uh, the fabulous public school teachers of whom we're both very proud. And so obviously we're big influences on us. It's a little surprising that none of the four boys, Four brothers, none of us became teachers, although I did teach for a little while at law school, but none of us became public school teachers um, because that's all we saw growing up. Yeah, you know, uh, I, I love the story, Rex. I love the, you know, just the little kids being with them. You know, I mean, that that is it. You, 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 to, to do it well, you can do it without it being a passion or a calling, but to do it well, you can't. And the best teachers that I know that you're all thinking of, your favorite teachers through the years, are those that really demonstrated that they cared. Um, and uh, as a matter of fact, when I taught in law school, even I actually wrote that on, I had that at the top of my notes every day. Uh, show them that you care. Just to remind myself every day that uh, um, I got to tell you something here. Nate is trying to distract me by putting funny things in our private chat, and I don't approve of it. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> just little kids. I like being with them. Um, but uh, I'll agree with uh, with the the coaches as well. Um, you know, um, if you get good coaches that care, it, people that didn't play team sports don't really understand how important that is to adolescents. To, to you know, when you're growing up, trying to figure out who you are to have those types of role models. So we were lucky to have plenty of them. I guess is what I'm saying. Also, Miss Page, twelfth grade English. No, no. Um, good question, Rex. Yeah, Rex is Rex has t- talked about a teacher made a difference in his life. It's his wife. So Mrs. Rex Scott, we, you're my hero. Yeah, we also choose Mrs. Rex Scott. Yes, yeah, she's the goat. one on the list. The goat. Um, man, to have done it for as long as she's done it, 37 years, that is, you're either beaten down or if you're not beaten down and you're still exuberant about it, man, that says something. Good for her. So, um, Speaking okay. of the Reds and getting beaten down, Seth Shaner asked the next question. In the past, specifically 2017, 2018, even when we had little to no hope of actually competing, I joined Chad, uh, that's me, Jason, Lyndon, and others in squinting and thinking if the stars aligned, the Reds could be at or above 500. Uh, for a long time, that was my our phrase, you know, well, can, how, can we squint? How can we see this team? Because we know we're going to be great. Um, we still use that occasionally, but uh, sometimes you had to squint. The funny thing now is the 2023 Reds should have a better rotation than the one in 2017, which included Tim Adelman, Scott Feldman, a bad Homer Bailey, Sal Romano, and an aged Bronson Arroyo. Although he says uh, Luis make 15 starts uh, that season. Why is it so much harder to get excited about this upcoming season as compared to years like that when we should have known all along? Let me uh, take a quick stab at this name. First of all, we did know all along, and I think we admitted that, but we were trying to – Having fun is, you know, enjoying baseball is way more, uh, it's, it's, it's more fun <laughs> to, to talk about it every week and to even follow the team if you're trying to be optimistic. You don't have to lie to yourself or to others, but um, it's, it's just more fun that way. The reason that it's so much harder, more hard, hard to get excited about this upcoming season as opposed to those years is, I mean, it, it's obvious to me. I mean, um, it's a combination of losing hundred games and Phil Castellini dumping on us and uh, then selling off all the players. I mean, you know, it's just the, we never, it, it was never this bad or this stark back then because they were at least pretending to us that they were trying and or sort of trying. And maybe we just hadn't quite yet learned the depths of the Castellini's depravity. Um, so Nate, what do you think? Well, first off, I am starting to get excited. I mean, we're, we're, we're a Trey Mancini away from me uh, convincing myself that this is going to be a competitive ball club. So stay tuned for that. Uh, those teams, uh, 2016 and 17, spent more than $20 million or so more than this current iteration is going to. So that sort of tempers the excitement a little bit. And also like those rosters, the lineups on those teams were a bunch of guys who – had had major league success. I don't think any of them were, uh, you know, would claim they were in their prime other than, you know, Votto was still Votto. But, you know, you could see a path to success if each of them clicked at the same time. And I don't think that's the case with this roster. I mean, our pitching could be really good, but, you know, again, we're talking about excitement here. We lost excitement when they traded two of the stalwarts of the rotation. And the hitting isn't exciting yet. But like I said, give me, give me some trade Mancini and I'll talk myself right into it. Yeah, I think that you've hit on something that uh, is, is correct about the, the answer to this question, which is you don't have as many players here that you can squint and still kind of see the old player they used to be that could be good. I mean, Votto's that way. Uh, but this outfield, who are you going to, you know, you're going to look at TJ Friedel and say, uh, I kind of see an above average outfielder there. No, I mean, I think he might be fine as a fifth, fourth, fifth outfielder. Uh, his great hair, love his hair. Um, but, you know, there aren't that many guys. Now, you know, Will Myers, can he be a little bit better? Okay. I squint a little bit and see that. Joey Votto comes back. Squint a little and see that, uh, you know. But it's a, it's a lot of, uh, you know, we just need Tyler Stevenson to be healthy. We need Jonathan Indy to be healthy. Um, and that, that's not as much of a, a squinting, which is basically trying to convince yourself of something that it's not. Yeah. Um, so. Um, and there's not as many guys that – there's not even as many lovable guys on this year's team. You know, I, I said a lot in that 2020 season when the Reds were, you know, uh, it was a difficult season for many uh, reasons, but 
they were just fun. And even that 2021 season, they had just a lot of guys that were easy to root for. And a lot of those guys have moved on. So there's a lot of guys now that aren't as easy to root for. Not there's anybody that I dislike on the team, but there's none of those guys that really are, are fan favorites other than the ones we just mentioned. So that's just a different, it's a different time. I, I think it's a bit of a similar argument to why, in my opinion, college basketball isn't as fun as it once was. Once players started bolting after a year, you lost that, uh, that, that attachment, that familiarity that you got with these four-year starters that you used to have. And in Cincinnati, you know, they haven't signed a multi-year contract or someone to a multi-year contract since Castellanos. So it's hard to get really invested in these guys when you don't expect them to be around for a long time. And the ones that you hope are, you're just praying that they stay healthy and that they can achieve some of the potential that we know they have. So you can – have fun with it. It's still baseball, which is better than just about everything else. But I think that's why it's not as exciting as those years when you had guys that we'd known and loved for a really long time. Yeah, I can handle being – that's why that's sort of what we keep talking about. I can handle being bad uh, if you have guys I like, you know, because yeah. I can have fun watching them. Uh, you went back to college basketball there, and I thought you were going to poke about uh, the Georgetown basketball a little bit more. No, the Georgetown Hoyas. College basketball was good. No, well, it's Georgetown. <laughs> You talk about players leaving. Uh, Patrick Ewing's the head coach at Georgetown, the best player in program history. Um, Patrick Ewing, there's no one remaining in the program from the four recruiting classes before this season. Every single player's transferred away. There's not a single player from any of the previous four recruiting classes Jeez. on the roster. So tune in next week. We're going to start the uh, Georgetown Hoyas podcast on the river front. It's the, <laughs> the Hoya front. I don't know. Um, good question, say, Seth. Uh, next comes from Hooper Powell. Hooper Powell says, if there was a movie to be made about the 2023 Reds similar to Major League, who would the main characters be played by? Let's start with Bob oh. Castellini. I'm thinking Jennifer Lopez, says Hooper, for Bob Castellini. So, yes, Jennifer Lopez. J-Lo is B-Cal, B-Cast, B-Castelli. All right, so that's who else we have here, Nate? What, Phil, Phil Castellini. First off, okay, I think ahead. we need to make this its its own podcast. Give dedicate a full hour to this. This is right up my alley. I wish I had more time to figure it out. But if Bob is going to be J Lo, we got to keep Phil. Got to keep keep the gender thing going on. We're very progressive here at the Riverfront, so we'll have Phil also be a female. I think it's Snooky. <laughs> Snooky. Oh, yeah. that's what that's way better than the only thing I could come up with. I was going to say. Bradley Cooper, but the, the Bradley Cooper from Wedding Crashers, who was like a you know big douche, you know, an overprivileged <laughs> douchebag. Um, and uh, but I, I, I like I like Snooky better. And if you don't know who Snooky is, go uh, go Google Snooky and just d be delighted. I feel like if you presented Phil with the role, hey, you're going to be played by Bradley Cooper, even douchey Cooper, he'd still be pretty pumped about it. Be like it's exactly right, it's exactly who I want to be. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but hey, Phil, you're going to be uh, Snooky. All right. Uh, who's the next character? We should uh, we should cast here. You got one? Um, you know, for Tyler the catcher is going to be in a uh, in a big role here, so we have got to figure out who's going to play Tyler Stevenson. And I went with Glenn Powell, who played oh. in Top Gun Maverick. Super handsome, dreamboat of a guy, much like Tyler Stevenson. Glenn Powell, a, a superstar waiting to happen. He's gonna he's gonna have a breakout at some point. Yeah, he played the. He's uh, also. So, go ahead. I was gonna say he's also played I, I, in a baseball movie. Oh, that's right. Everybody's got what everybody everybody wants some. Everybody wants some. Uh, Richard Linklater's college baseball movie. Uh, that's right. Fantastic. Um, he was uh, played the, the the sort of Iceman role for the uh, new Top Gun. If you didn't see Top Gun Maverick, what's wrong with you? But uh, yeah, he's just he's too, he's aggressively handsome. It makes me uncomfortable. He's so handsome. I don't I don't know how more than one person can be that handsome. It's um, not fair. Yeah, so I, I don't have anything better for uh, for Tyler Stevenson. Um, for Joey Votto, I'm, I'm saying we, we cast Joey Votto as Joey Votto because... I love it. Who would you want to watch more in that role? The only uh, other person I could think of was maybe Ryan Reynolds. Oh, okay, another, Ryan Reynolds. An another Canadian who is aging gracefully. Yeah, and a, a fun guy. Yeah. I'll, I will watch anything with Ryan Reynolds in it. Literally Joey anything. Votto. Oh my goodness! There's only one thing they could be in that I would not watch, and that was be uh, Lord of the Rings number four. I wouldn't watch. I wouldn't watch that mess. Um, what about Nick Crawl? I tried. <laughs> I, I could not think of anybody for Nick Crawl. So this is all you. 
Well, I, you know, uh, I wanted to. I wish that uh, that Hooper hadn't already cast Bob Castellini because I was going to cast Bob Castellini with uh, at my least favorite red zoner with uh, my least favorite actor. But since Bob Castellini has already been cast, we got to have this guy in here, and so he's going to play the villain in a different role. It's going to be Mark uh, Mark Ruffalo is going to play Nick <laughs> Crawl. Now is that is that rude about Nick Crawl? Should I should I have not done that? Well, it's too late now. We don't censor each other on this podcast, so it's in the ether and hilarious. Mark Ruffalo. <laughs> I had a hard time. I was trying to think about David Bell. Did, did you go up with any for David for David Bell? No, I think whoever it is needs to be complimentary, and I'll explain that when we get to a later question. I'm sort of feel bad for David Bell over there. Yeah, absolutely. I know which question well, you're we, talking about. We, we bring back Brad Pitt from his Moneyball days. Make Brad Pitt uh, play David Bell. There he, he deserves that. Uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman was uh, manager Art Howe, I think, in, in the Moneyball movie. Mm-hmm. And of course, Philip Seymour Hoffman's not with us anymore. I was actually going to suggest um, J.K. Simmons. Now, J.K. Simmons is older Ooh. than David Bell, but uh, significantly older. But if you ever saw Whiplash, J.K. Simmons is just sort of a – he was the quote-unquote coach and the, the motivator, so often fiery motivator. And so I, that's who, who I was thinking. But, no, I feel Love bad it. for David Bell. I'm going to go with Brad Pitt. Love it. Um. Right, here, I've got I've got two for you, Nate. Let's go. Tommy Pham will be played by Will Smith, and Jock Peterson will be played by Chris Rock. <laughs> Done. No <laughs> argument, no pushback whatsoever. Makes it's sense, right? <laughs> Who too else? Good. Who else do we need to cast? Uh, Jonathan India has got to be in there for sure. And I went with the only choice, in my opinion, and that is Timothy Chalamet. Oh yes, I've been trying to think. That's a, I had a different one that I'll, I'll use for someone else, but uh, oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. Has to be. You got the locks. You got the locks to pull it off. I was trying to think of someone with the locks, and I couldn't come up with anyone. So I went. The, I was going to go the other direction, but I like it. Timothy Chalamet, who I really disliked until uh, last year, mm-hmm. or two, or, you know, two years ago. Whenever the French Dispatch and Dune came out in the same year, I was like, oh yeah, that guy's, that guy's pretty good. Um, anybody else that we really need to cast, or should we move on? I went really quickly with uh, Danny McBride playing Graham Ashcraft because that made me oh, laugh. Oh, Danny McBride. Yeah, absolutely. We'll go with uh, Michael B. Jordan and Robert Pattinson for Hunter Green and Nick Lodolo. I think oh, they can both pull it off. There and we go. Every, everybody else, they're just going to be played by uh, no-name actors you've never heard of, kind of like the rest of the Reds. Yeah, kind of like the rest of the Reds. The sad uh, Mike Moustakas walking away from Great American Ballpark um, is going to be played by Paul Dano. I don't know why. I just, I just wanted to get him in the. He's a good actor. I want to get him in the movie. He likes obscure indie movies. So, I mean, so. <laughs> exactly. So the last one I had, Nate, is we have to cast you and I. This is actually twenty twenty. Oh. Hooper asked about twenty twenty three, but uh, I thought back to twenty twenty two, and there got to be a couple of loud mouth fans who yell about a uh, a billboard. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to be played by as I am every time we get asked this question over the since two thousand seven we started this. For some reason, someone always asks who's going to who plays who in the, the Riverfront uh, podcast movie or former of the Red Leg Nation radio movie. And I'm always played by, and this is what my answer every time is going to be, uh, uh, Melissa McCarthy, obviously. And, uh, and Nate, I think I propose that you're going to be played by Margot Robbie. Is that all right? Done. <laughs> Done. That's awesome. perfect. There we go. Melissa McCarthy and Margot Robbie. Next question comes from James Scott Pyle. James Scott, don't call me Gomer Pyle. Sorry about that, James. I had to do it. Um, in what order, this is a great question. I actually love this question. Um, and I could dive into this one for a long time, but we won't. In what order would you put these Reds managers in the Reds Hall of Fame? So the managers he gives us are Pat Moran, the manager of the 1919 Cincinnati Reds, Lou Pinella, the manager of the 1990 world champion Cincinnati Reds, and Dusty Baker. Moran, Pinella, Baker. I think there's only one order for those three uh, in terms of Reds Hall of Fame history. What do you think, Nate? You want to give me yours first? Or you want me to dive into it? Um, I went with Sweet Lou, the Moran, then Dusty, but this is definitely more your domain, so run with it. You're close. I think I would go with Moran, Pinella, and then Dusty. And really, the only reason why is because Lou Pinella was only a Reds manager for three years, and one of those seasons had a losing record. But obviously, he won uh, the World Cha- World Series first World Series since 1976, won 90 plus games twice. Um, the 992 teams were both uh, both good, obviously. Pat Moran was a Reds manager for five seasons. And, of course, won the 1919 World Series completely above board. 
Uh, he also, you know, finished uh, second a couple times, third another time, um, and uh, pretty good overall winning percentage with the Reds of 564. Lupinel's winning percentage with the Reds, 525. Um, Pat Moran also, uh, unfortunately, uh, passed away at the age of 48, and uh, he was a heavy drinker and he had a kidney kidney ailment and passed away earlier, He or he may have been a Reds manager for longer. Um Pat Moran, but if you, he died at 48. But if you go look up a picture of him, he looked like he was 72 when he managed the Reds. People were <laughs> people looked old back then. Dusty Baker, third. Um, not because Dusty Baker was bad. He obviously wasn't. He was the Reds manager for uh, six years as well. Winning percentage of 524. Finished first a couple of times. Neither of the other uh, Reds managers finished. That we mentioned here finished first more than once. But, you know, um, was never able to advance in the playoffs and – also, really, during the uh, playoffs, he did silly things. So, uh, Dusty looks a lot better in retrospect, but uh, I put him behind Pat Moran and Lou Pinella. But, but three good, three good well, managers. Well, maybe this is a hot take. Maybe not. I don't know. But should Dusty Baker just not be in the Reds Hall of Fame? I don't think he should be in the Reds Hall of Fame. No, I three winning seasons and zero playoff mm-hmm. success. I mean, he'll, he should, he will be in the Hall of the Hall of Fame. You know, I think so. Yeah. But the Reds Hall of Fame, I think uh, we can do without. Maybe just one single toothpick. <laughs> I don't know. You know, maybe I put him in. I mean, he, he was the uh, the manager of the only teams that were that were sort of bright lights for a long period of uh, a long and ongoing period of garbage. So I don't know. You make make an argument. But um, next question. That's a good one, uh, James. Good question. Next from James Urban, and we'll try to. We got uh, what, a couple more here, but um, actually, we got. Oh gosh, we got to fly through these, Nate. This happens every stupid time. James Urban, Urban, two questions this week, he says. Living dangerously, I know. Yeah, dangerous is your middle name, James Dangerous Urban. Number one, what's the most overhyped movie of all time? Uh, to me, there's only one real answer to that question. Most overhyped movie of all time. Now, uh, that's distinguished from most overrated movie of all time, which is a three-way tie with all the Lord of the Rings movies um, as most overrated. Overhyped. You're canceled. <laughs> <laughs> Overhyped is a movie that, to me, that w- the way I read that is a movie that was just hyped up bigger than anything and it fell flat on its face. To me, the Star Wars uh, Episode One, The Phantom Menace, or any of the more recent uh, Star Wars uh, you know, episodes, maybe as well. But to me, that's what it has to be. Most overhyped movie. Because I remember when that movie came out, finally, after all these years, a prequel to the movie of our, our, our childhoods. And boy, it was... It was bad. There, there's pod racing, though. Had some, had some pod <laughs> racing. Pods. Midichlorians. Uh, what do you think, Matt? You got a different uh, yeah. answer? That's a good answer. I do want to nominate uh, Suicide Squad because that was a steaming hot pile of garbage. It was It was hyped. Yeah, so I think you could probably yeah. say that. Boy, so DC. Well, uh, You know, I complain about comic book movies. Really, I just complain about, but you need to complain about DC movies because they're... You could nominate anything that The Rock is in because he hypes everything he does to death and he hasn't put out a quality film since i don't know the first jumanji second i will i guess i'm not gonna listen to your jungle cruise slander your black adam slander outrageous completely outrageous all right next question from james we'll let you have the second one what's the official mascot of our beer league softball team every good team needs a mascot as much as we reference the simpsons to me the only answer it can possibly be is the capital city goofball the Capital City Goofball. Nate, any other mascots? I have nothing better. I wanted it to start with like fighting because, you know, like, the fighting Irish. I always think that's pretty fun, especially if we're drinking a lot of beers. Um, I did find that uh, before the University of Nebraska became the Cornhuskers, did you know any of their previous nicknames? I have no idea. No. I'm excited to they learn. They were uh, the Man Killing Mastodons <laughs> and the Mighty Bug Eaters. Oh, why didn't they keep that? That's what I'm saying. So we might wow. we could adopt one of those if we get bored with the capital city goofball you know, groups. And I'm just thinking, hearing those two uh, former Nebraska nicknames, I'm thinking what an opportunity was missed by the uh, the Cleveland baseball franchise and the Washington football team when they were looking for nicknames <laughs> in recent years. They were, out there. they were available. Uh, next question comes from Jordan Salisbury. Jordan says, hey, guys, just curious, what's your personal favorite what-if scenario that might have happened in Red Sixers that you wonder about? Is it Christy Matthewson staying a red the rest of his career before going back to New York? I wrote about that uh, for my uh, uh, newsletter. That's a, that's a that's a what if. 
or it gave him away because they didn't want to pay him. Is it Frank Robinson not being traded to Baltimore and being a part of the big red machine, or at least in the 1970 World Series? That's a big what if. Uh, but he was an old 30 when they traded him is what I heard. Uh, maybe it's the Vita Blue trade that had never been nixed in the 70s. Uh, what's your per per personal favorite to ponder on? Mine is always going to be because it's what I, I don't remember any of those. I know about them. The ones mentioned there, they're all good what ifs. But to me, it was 1994. What if the 1994 postseason had been canceled because of the strike? Because I, I'm, I will. this is a hill I will die on. The Cincinnati Reds were the best team in the world that year. They were going to win a World Series. That's what I thought at the time, and I'm just I'm going to stick with it. Do you have a what if, Nate? I don't have anything better than that. You know, I mean, what if what if Shotzi was a poodle? <laughs> That's kept me up at night lately. Um, what if uh, what if Marge shot allowed facial hair? That would have been fun. But we missed out I, some good years. Yeah, it would have been nice to see Marge shot with a goatee. She could have rocked it. She could have rocked it. Um, all right, good, good what is. Next from David Hurst. David, new year, new me. Instead of focusing on the negative, I want to ask something positive. What about the 2023 Reds gives you hope that they will not lose 100 games or the dreaded 102, which would precipitate me getting a tattoo of the Riverfront's choice, the Riverfront family's choice. What is there about the 2023 Reds that gives you hope that they will not lose 100 games? I think we've already answered that. I just think uh, that uh, everything's not going to go wrong again. I'm very hopeful. Yeah, I just want to also throw out there that losing 102 games is not actually a negative because then Chad <laughs> has to get the tattoo, which we're all sort of rooting for. So either they don't win 100 games, which is good, or lose 100 games, which is good, or they do lose 102, which is also fantastic. I got a little nervous down the stretch this uh, past year because <laughs> of uh, the potential that I was going to have to get that tattoo that I made a ridiculous uh, – pledge early in the season about, but I did have to say that I enjoyed how much everyone kind of uh, was rooting against me. It, it was heartwarming. <laughs> thanks. Thanks a lot, family. Um, all right, David, time for a second question. And uh, there's not time for a second question, but we love you. So we're going to let, we're going to, we are, and we let James Urban get away with it. Uh, what should David Bell's new year's resolution be? This is what you were talking about earlier. Nate. What's what should David Bell's 2023 new year's resolution be? It should, uh, it should be to smile more. The, the guy looks like a hostage victim. I went and got on the interwebs and just Googled David Bell. Actually, David as you Bell do Reds, a couple, if you, as you do a couple times a week. If you just Google David Bell, a football player comes up. But uh, David Bell Reds, and my guy does not look like he is enjoying his day. Or maybe he just doesn't like being in front of the camera. I don't know. I can imagine that the uh, the grind, the day to day grind of this job would wear on a man. So, David, Mr. Bell. Please just smile more. Do it for the people. We're with you. We're with you. I think his resolution, I agree. I'm with you. He should resolve to try to, you know, new year, new me, as, as David Hurst said. Uh, I think he sh his resolution should be to get his resume polished up and maybe possibly finally get a get a job with a, with a real franchise that puts him in a position to win oh. because he's been put in a bad situation. You know, I, he's not, I don't think he's a great manager. We'll have, we've had this conversation before. We'll have it this season until he gets fired, but – well, he's just been um, – he's not been well-served by management above him, and, and you got to feel for the guy because he's not – yeah. And not that he's great, but I don't think he's awful either. He's just sort of David Bellish. Um, Chris G. asks this next question. I'm not sure who that is. Chris G. Are the Reds planning to play in 2023? And if so, why? How I don't know who this guy is. I don't know how he got into our – uh, Patreon uh, feed there to ask this question. Chris he obviously G. did not listen to our red solutions where we're trying to be positive and optimistic. Yeah. Reminder that Chris Garber is never coming back on the podcast. So uh, if he's going to, if he's going to be negative, Nancy, if he's going to be Debbie Downer. Take that um, back. We need the, we need the listenership. People will just start fleeing the uh, subscriptions if they hear Chris isn't coming back. It's funny. I do hear from, from hundreds of people every week that say they downloaded the show just to see if Chris was on it and then deleted it immediately when they realized he wasn't on the show. So I'm one of those we'll people. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, so Chris G, please come back to the show. Last question comes from Carl J. Mitz. First of all, is that the best name in the Riverfront family? It's up there. Carl J. We got some good ones, though. I mean, we do have some Cooper, good ones. Powell, Rex, Scott. That's true. Here's a list of available free agent SPs. I presume that means starting pitchers, Nate, but I'm not good at the 
of the English language. A la Wade Miley or Mike Miner, who on this list do you have the red signing? If anyone, note I've excluded Johnny Cueto. He's the obvious answer. Yes, we already talked about that. So here's, the, here's who he, he lists. David Price, Mike Miner, and he in parentheses. This is parenthetical information, Nate. He says, yuck. Uh, Zach Grinke, Michael Waka, Dylan Bundy, Chris Archer, Kohei Arihara, Chad Cool, Denny Duffy, Joe Ross, Annabelle Sanchez, Matt Harvey, nope, he says, and Garrett Richards. The answer is, is none of them. <laughs> That's who I see the red signing. But if not, Chad, my favorite Chad, I call him Chad Cool. Actually, that's, that's what he calls me. So, what do you think? Um, Red, Red's going to sign any of those guys? I saw some projections earlier in the offseason of uh, Michael Walker getting like a two-year, $16 million deal. I, I would love for the Reds to do that. I think he's worth that money. Um, I'd love to see them sign somebody for two years so I know what to root for next year. Taking a fly around Dylan Bundy wouldn't be bad either, but yeah, I I don't expect them to sign any of those guys. I hope that they could sign a couple. Zach Greinke is obviously too expensive. Yeah, yeah, he's the, he's the one that stands out as as being definitely no, and and some of the rest are a mix of not good versus the Flyers that we're looking at. So I could see the Reds, uh, I, I could see the Reds signing a couple of those guys, but man, I just it's hard to, for me to project <laughs> what they're going to do because there's no no sense. Uh, they, they, they might freak out one day. Like they did last year, and go sign a Mike Miner type. I'm just, I hope that doesn't Woo, happen. Let's go. The Mike Miner type. Nate, uh, we got to get out of here. Any final thoughts? That was that was fun, though, by the way. Let me just say that before you give your final thoughts. That was super fun. The uh, viewer mail episodes are always my favorites. Um, nothing baseball related. Just want to say that um, you know, thoughts and prayers still going out to DeMar Hamlin, the Bills, the Bengals communities, uh, there's families, um, everybody involved with that situation. A lot of them. A lot of positive news lately, so we'll just keep up the uh, keep up the good vibes going that way. Absolutely, and good news uh, today uh, about uh, him and his recovery. So fingers crossed, and thoughts and prayers going out to, to him and the entire, uh, not the entire NFL family, but certainly the entire uh, Buffalo Bills family. Um, all right, well, this is the Riverfront. Thank you to everyone for listening, supporting, downloading. Um, as I've said in the past, and I haven't said it in a while, the the, the best way to grow a podcast is to tell your friends about it. Word of mouth is really shown to be the only successful way of truly growing a podcast. And so, as I used to say, if you like us, talk about us. If you don't like us, keep your mouth shut. Nobody needs to hear that. Um, but uh, please do remember to subscribe to the show, either on YouTube or in your favorite podcast app. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. We're at Riverfront Cincy on all those platforms. And as always, a big thank you to our friends, the family, our supporters at patreon.com slash riverfront. Cincy, I say it every week, and I mean it, the show would literally not be possible without the support of the family. So we'd uh, love to have you join in uh, as little as a couple bucks a month to, to join in the hijinks. So uh, click the link in the show notes or patreon.com slash riverfront. Cincy. Nate, I'm with you, man. These viewer mail ones are fun. Thanks for doing this. Loved it. Thanks for having me, and uh, we'll see you next week. Absolutely. For Nate Dotson and Melissa McCarthy, this is Melissa McCarthy saying so long, everyone.